Hi, everybody, and welcome to Web Visions. Welcome back to Web Visions. You guys have probably been here since before I was. I, I wanted to sleep in a little bit. Uh, but we're going to grab a couple of the speakers. We're going to have an interview. I'm Cami Chaos from Strange Love Live. We've got Strange Love Live Productions back at the desk there, manning things, sending this all out to the stream. And right now, we're going to talk to Luke Williams, who was the keynote this morning. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Luke. How are you? Very well. Doing well. So what was your keynote on? What, was you, what were you talking about? Uh, the keynote was on um, thinking the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is it um, was talking about disruptive thinking. So the need to like, think in a new way to make really big change, not just incremental change. Not just to say, oh, maybe I should eat something more healthy for breakfast, but to do something monumental. No, it's a ma it would be a major sort of behavior change or lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. So, um, so really it was about, you know, in those initial stages of starting anything new, how do you really break out of established patterns and traditional patterns of thinking, which we're all trapped by because there's so many, um, that's the way we learn, it comes from our expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many, there's so many cliches that are out there that are almost um, invisible. I mean, we use them without even knowing that we're using them. It's so it's very important ingrained. when you, yeah, it's because yeah. the brain um, uh, is constantly setting up and using these, these patterns mm -hmm. and it's the way we get through life. So the keynote was on um, how do you deliberately break those patterns when you need to start thinking about something in a fresh way. And so how specifically does that apply to um, the future of the web and web visions? I mean, this is all about the, you know, the yeah. big future of the internet. Well, it was um, one of the key parts of the speech was this is a technology conference, mm -hmm. but a lot of talk about sort of disruption, disruptive innovation is about waiting for that big disruptive technology and how to sort of spot the change that a new mm -hmm. technology is going to bring. Um, now, that's important, but the, the emphasis on the talk was for everybody here in a technology conference that um, just relying on a technology to do things in a different way isn't enough. We actually have to change our traditional thinking habits as well and that can in fact be far more effective. So in order to do disruptive innovation you don't have to rely purely just on a technology. Um, in, some, in fact some of the best disruptive innovations are low-tech. Well because the technology without us is actually nothing. I mean we're not in the age that the computers are taking over the world. Right. They still rely on us. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're not delivering keynotes at web visionary <laughs> conferences, what are you doing? You're a fellow at Frog Design? Yeah, fellow at Frog Design. So um, I've been affiliated with Frog Design about eight or nine years now, mm -hmm. um, based in New York. And I'm also a adjunct professor of innovation at New York University in the Stern School of Business. Um, and what I do there is teach a, a graduate MBA program mm -hmm. in this sort of thinking. So it's, it's teaching MBA students to augment their really strong analytical skills and their, mm -hmm. their judgment skills with um, some creative thinking skills as well. Mm -hmm. So to take them from just being purely analytical, from just looking at things from a technical standpoint and teaching them to think more creatively yeah. and more independently? Absolutely. And it's, te it's teaching them to look for and develop unconventional strategies and solutions to whatever business problems they, they're going to face out there in the real world. Mm -hmm. How does someone, how do you make that decision? How do you go, I think what I want to do with my life is teach people how to think differently? Well, it's just really the background I came from. I mean, I came from a product design background mm -hmm. and a marketing background. And, you know, the more, so I, you know, I came from an education that emphasized this sort of thinking. Mm -hmm. And the more I dealt with clients in business, executives in business, um, the more business problems I saw out there, the more students that I had interaction with, I noticed there was a, there was a huge gap between you know, the vocabulary of um, a business audience and the vocabulary of a design audience. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of talk over the last you know, three years in particular about bridging these worlds. And that's what I'm really passionate about doing. I'm trying to um, sort of bridge the gap between the vocabulary differences and mm -hmm. between the styles of thinking. Because I'm just, I'm sick of this, um, you know, perception by so many people out there that they're not creative. There's or they a can't huge think divide. I, it's huge. In Portland, we have a, a really big, we have a large creative community, and we have yep. a large tech community. And there's there's definitely some overlap, but I'm always amazed when I talk to the tech community and the, yep. the developers and the designers, and they they don't think of themselves as creatives often, no. and I'm blown away by that. And well, that's it's just, right. Yeah. It's just how they categorize themselves. It's yep. not even what it is that they're doing. Yeah. 
I think um, so many people are told that they're not creative at such a young age. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you ask kids, I mean, kids don't even make the distinction. You know, yeah. they're busy playing, they're busy, they're busy sort of creating new responses to their world all the time. So they have a high, I often see children with a high design motivation. Now, as they get older, they start learning the right way to do things, like the adult way to do things. Mm -hmm. And that's, where, that's when these patterns really start occurring. And what happens when they start learning the right ways to do things, the so-called right ways, their design motivation fades away. Mm -hmm. Now, it's only those people with maybe drawing ability or artistic skill. Or music. Or music yeah. or dance or something mm -hmm. like that where... Something in an artistic field. Exactly. And they're singled out and they're told you're creative. And so they get the encouragement and their motivation sort of stays with them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think they pursue, you know, creative paths down the track. Now, for the other people who are left behind, who have been told, you know, because they didn't have artistic abilities or couldn't dance or, you know, didn't have any musical skill or whatever it was, they were told they weren't creative. Mm -hmm. And they often go, you know, from my experience and what I've witnessed, they go down the sort of science or mathematical track or end up in a profession where they don't believe there's a, there's a high degree of creativity required. So are you really just unteaching people? A lot of it's about that. That's yeah. what the, the MBA course is about, um, really breaking the MBA mindset mm. and um, about, and it's getting away from sort of standard case studies um, approach. It's, it emphasizes sort of collaborative um, creativity and mm. learning to think of lots of different options and not just sort of choose one. So you've got students that are paying way too much for an education. I mean, right. they're paying a great amount of money. They're studying hard. They're working hard to get an education. And they come see you and you say, wait a minute, let's turn that back a little bit. I mean, yeah, well, what I'm saying to them is um, everything else they're learning, because the, the innovation and design course at Stern is very different from their other courses. Mm -hmm. but, and. Um, but what we say to them is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the other things that you're learning are um, irrelevant or anything like that. They're still incredibly powerful. I mean, all the analytical um, and many of the linear thinking skills they're learning in other courses are incredibly powerful. However, um, it's, I liken it to driving a car with three wheels. Right? <laughs> it's like they're missing the fourth wheel. Yeah. And that's what we tell them. You know, you need to start thinking more creatively. You need to have a fluency with this sort of disruptive thinking mm -hmm. in order to tackle the challenges of today. Because, I mean, so many pundits are saying, and, it, and it, that certainly there's plenty of evidence to support it, that we're leaving the information age and we're entering into a new age. Mm -hmm. and, and whether you call it the creative age, the conceptual age, the disruptive age, whatever you like to call it, it all really means the same thing, which is we cannot just rely on our sort of analytical information processing judgment skills any longer. Um, everybody now needs the ability to think creatively and come up with, um, you know, amazing ideas in all these different sorts of endeavors. So let me ask you, and, and this is something that I, I often ponder, probably when I'm washing my hair or something, but do you think that the fact that we're leaving the information age has to do with every piece of information you could possibly want is readily available to everyone now? You no longer have to go to a library, you no longer have to go to a school. You can get any information that you need, you know, click, 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 type, right. type, type. So the information is no longer really an issue, it's how you process it? Yeah, it's a given. There's so much information out there, it's a given. You can find answers to pretty much anything, but it's the it's what you do with the information now that's mm -hmm. of utmost importance. It's the meaning that you, you give it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is so much, you know, we do a lot of um, research at Frog, obviously. We do uh, particularly a kind of research called ethnography where we're going out and observing. So instead of asking people what they think, we sort of watch them in their day-to-day -day behavior. Mm -hmm. Now you can, you can write as many observations about that sort of behavior as you like, and we end up with uh, tons of observations for even an hour of watching somebody. But it's what you do with those observations to mm -hmm. turn them into meaningful insights mm -hmm. that's important. And that comes from synthesis and uh, recognizing patterns yeah. and um, coming up with c seeing things, configurations in a new way. So they're new configurations of knowledge. So it's, it's, um, it's giving the data meaning. So yeah. that's the important part now. And that's a skill that everybody needs to learn mm -hmm. now, not just the creative designers. All right. 
Uh, if we wanted to find you somewhere, where would we find you? Not your address, just where can we find you on the internet? <laughs> oh, on the internet? Um, you, you know, Frog Design is pretty much uh, the main place you'll find me. Frog Design and um, Frog Design has an amazing platform called Design Mind, mm -hmm. which you know puts a lot of these things that we're talking about into a dialogue that we have with the community. So through Twitter, through um, the Design Mind publications, through video, through blogs. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, great. It's a very rich information source on this on this very subject. Awesome. So. Well, Luke, it was really great to talk to you. Thank awesome. you so much for joining us. Thank you. After the session, we'll be getting in oh. 10 minutes. Perfect timing.